Welcome back to Real Talk with Chuck and Pam. We have a new episode for you that we haven't done before. This is going to be all the different interviews that we have had over the past two weeks. We've had so many of them. We want to share anything and everything we can about them. And Chuck, it's kind of interesting. I was looking at our list of the five different interviews that we have, and yours are movies, and mine are all TV shows. Why do you think that is? Because I'm willing to sit and wait for Apple TV stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, you're, you're <laughs> foolish in that. For those of you who don't know, uh, Apple TV, and I'm just going to come out and say it, the worst, <laughs> the worst as far as interviews are concerned and being, I'm just going to say it, inconsiderate. To the press. How long? And, you know, you, I don't know whether you're more patient, more kind, or just more foolish than me, <laughs> but you have sat in these waiting rooms for these interviews. How long? Okay, so I'm going to back it up. I love Apple TV's content. I, I'm not saying anything about I, the content. But I am, and I am willing to sit and wait because I do like the content. However, I do get very frustrated. And then I'm also going to say in one of these interviews, they texted me and said, we're running early. Can you make it early? And I'm like, oh, yeah. But you haven't answered the question. How long have you sat in the waiting room waiting for some of these interviews? I've waited an hour. An hour. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. I knitted a scarf. I think it was your scarf that I knitted. I like that scarf. Good. Um, <laughs> well, better you than me. And I'm sure that, you know, the listeners are going to uh, appreciate your patience. Well, good. I hope that they do. I really had a, fun, a lot of fun with all three of these interviews. Um, and are they all three on Apple? No, two are on Apple and one is on Netflix. Okay. So, Tell us about one of them. Well, let's let's start with liaison, um, and this is an interesting one. It was a very um, unique concept in some ways, and yet a very rote one at the same time. Stars Vincent Castle, who I interviewed. He's also the executive producer, and it's liaison. Um, this is a mystery spy thriller, but it's smart. It's espionage. It's a love story. And we get all of that in the very first episode. At the end of the first episode, we, we realize that Vincent Castle's character of Gabriel, he's the bad guy in this. He always plays the heavy. Um, he's tough. He can fight. He's willing to kill in this movie. Um, but we realize there's a little bit more to it than meets the eye. Is he really a a bad, bad guy? Is he a bad guy with a heart of gold? And An anti-hero, if you will. Okay, we're going to go superhero on this. No, yeah. no, anti-hero. Okay, yeah. No, Dirty I just, Harry was an anti-hero. Okay. Oh, know, okay. People who break yeah, the yeah. rules. And, well, he's, no, he goes a little further than just breaking the rules. Okay. Um, but it's, it's somebody who has a lot of regrets in his life, and we see those as the series continues. Um, and we learn a little bit about how he wants to make amends with maybe th some things that have gone wrong in his past. We learn more about his past, and um, Eva Green stars alongside of him, and she's on the other side of the legal fence, and she is part of the, is it M? What is the British version? MI6. Of? MI6. Jesus she, Christ. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. She's on the good guy side. Are you sure they're the good guys? They're, Are you sure? I'm not positive, mm -hmm. actually. Every, I think I think what this, this series shows is that there are lots of shades of gray. Anyway, check it out. I was hooked immediately and have really enjoyed seeing this, this series um, streaming on Apple TV+. And check out my interview with Vincent Castle. Vincent Castle, thank you so much for joining me on WCIA-TV to talk about your incredibly intense and thrilling new series on Apple TV, Liaison. I appreciate it. Thank you. Now, um, and I have to tell you, I am totally hooked on it. I only allowed myself to watch three episodes. I didn't want to get ahead, although as soon as we're done with this episode, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm going to go watch it. <laughs> Thanks. Good to know. <laughs> um, and tell me, you you executive produced this, and I want to talk a little bit about that if we have time at the end, but let's get into your character of Gabriel. Um, he kind of teeters between the bad guy and the bad guy with some good intentions, but we never see quite where he falls, at least not yet. Um, it's a really complicated character. To me, it is. Tell me about creating that character from your perspective. Well, I think the characters become interesting when you don't know what to think about them from one scene to another. You know, then they become uh, mysterious and eventually uh, intriguing. If you know what to think, about somebody from the start then what's the point of keep on watching the, the series really you know it's it's interesting to see one revealing different aspect of him as we do in real life you know i mean i keep i mean personally i keep on i keep on discovering new aspect of myself being confronted a new situation 
that comes across my life day by day. Um, I don't really believe in that thing that there's a good guy and a bad guy. I think this is more like a cinematic point of view. But in real life, we all know that it's always more complicated than that, more right. complex. And that's what I've been trying to portray with him. Um, let's talk a little bit about creating a series. Um, you executive produced this. What hooked you? What made you want to be a part of this series? Well, the thing is that I've been approached by uh, the production by Apple very earlier on. Um, uh, Virginie Brac, the author, was already there, of course, involved, but the rest was totally not clear. And so I didn't want to be caught in something uh, where I would be deceived by the choices of others, and I wanted to keep an end on, on it. Um, so I managed to have this position so I would have a little more latitude artistically. And uh, the other thing why I wasn't interested being involved with this is that it was for me the first, first, first opportunity to get involved with such an international project without leaving my French identity and being able to create that French anti-hero far from the stereotypes that we have of spies and all these things, you know, and, and come up with something, let's say, a little more gritty and a little more realistic somehow was very interesting to me. Very good. Um... You know, talking about going all over the world, this 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 series does take us to a lot of different places. One thing that has always intrigued me about your characters that you play um, throughout your cinematic history is your language, your command of languages, plural, um, incredible command of, of that. And you use this in this film as well, English and French and other languages. Um, how many languages do how many languages do you speak, and what is the most difficult thing for you to do when you're using different languages within the series? I speak properly if my English is proper. It is, <laughs> I would good. say I would say I speak four pretty good, five I can pretend, <laughs> six if I work on it. But then you know it's about making believe really so for example arabic which i speak in in the siri i don't speak arabic but i've learned how to pronounce and to look so it looks like it's natural but i don't speak arabic arabic is really complicated but i worked on vietnamese i worked on russian i worked on on you know it's kind of a challenge each and every time and what i realized that the more you learn how to speak languages the easiest it becomes because your brain starts starts to function in a different way. And plus, the idea is to keep your mind open, to stay flexible and to be uh, to be open to anything new appearing in your life. Yeah, I unfortunately have to wrap up quickly. Can you tell me very quickly about what is one scene that was that you can't wait for your viewers to see you in a, an important scene to you without giving anything away? I would say the last one <laughs> <laughs> now you have to go run run when you'll see it you'll understand <laughs> all right wonderful vincent castle Cheers. thank you so much for talking with me today about Thanks. liaison and apple tv plus bye-bye so there you have it with vincent castle i have to tell you i really enjoyed talking to this very intelligent man who his command over different languages is just incredible and he just had this twinkle in his eye what a sweetheart mm -hmm. and so polar opposite as to the roles that he plays. Tell us about the interview that you just recently had for the movie. Emily. Okay. Emily is a strange, strange film. Really? Strange film in a lot of ways. And I have to tell you, I'll be honest with you, it's something that grew on me. I, w I was kind of kept it at arm's length for a while. Uh, and, um, and and then I finally figured out what, what the uh, actors, uh, actress and director writer was doing. Uh, I was able to interview um, a young actress by the name of Emma Mackey and an actor by the name of Oliver Jackson Cohen. Emma Mackey plays Emily Bronte. That's who the film is about. And uh, Mr. Jackson Cohen is William we Waitman. He plays a curate who comes to the village where Emily and the Brontes are living. A what? A curate, a, 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 like a pastor. Oh. Curate, I okay. guess would be the proper thing. Okay. Bra uh, Bronte's father was a curate as well, and okay. he takes this young man under his wing. I didn't know much about Emily Bronte, and then I found out that there's a reason why. 
We don't know much right. about Emily Bronte. And apparently, uh, much of what we know, we know through her sister, Charlotte. And it has been called into question as to whether she is a reliable, she was a reliable uh, person as far as giving us the accuracy of what happened within their lives and what happened with Emily. Uh, many historians feel as though there was some jealousy involved, even though Charlotte wrote uh, Jane Eyre, uh, but she felt as though, people feel as though maybe we're not getting the whole story about Emily's behavior. We don't really know much about her. We're not quite sure how she dies. She dies at the age of 30. Uh, we're not quite sure where she gets the inspiration to write, write Wuthering Heights, her big novel, her only novel. Uh, we do know that it was a success after she died which, of course, happens a lot back in the 1700s and 1800s. Uh, and so this movie, Emily, uh, the actress Frances O'Connor, she has been fascinated by this, and um, so she fills in the gaps here. She writes this screenplay, and based on what she knows and certain conjecture, she's filling in the gaps of Bronte's life through this movie. So, an interesting approach. Uh, as I say, I was able to uh, interview Emma Mackey and Oliver Jackson Cohen, and uh, they formed a relationship that spilled off the camera uh, uh, while making this film, which was obvious as I talked to them. Um, very smart, um, charming uh, couple. Very cute. Very cute. Uh, and they had some really interesting things to say as to how they would approach these characters, both of them very repressed, and both of them uh, in need of someone to just kind of be themselves around, really. So let's listen to your interview. Chuck Kaplinski with WCIA-TV. I'm talking to Emma McKay and Oliver Jackson Cohen about Emily, a beautiful film uh, about uh, the author Emily Bronte, uh, known primarily for the, uh, writing Weathering Heights. You know, having read Weathering Heights years ago and seeing the many film versions, the location there is so important. And I know you guys shot on location in Scotland. How did that affect how you got into the characters and the whole situation? We, we shot in Yorkshire, in, in, in Yorkshire, the Yorkshire Dales and the Moors. And it was, it was, I mean, it's, it's such a huge, obviously essential part to the film, as you said, and it's, you know, we were, we would, we would, you know, we, we had, I think we were, we were all living in a house together, the cast members, we all lived in this kind of, house in the middle of nowhere and then we had to drive 30 minutes to base every morning and then from base once we got all our costume and all of our hair and everything on we had like a 45 minute drive to the house to the location so we felt and Ollie will probably agree with me but we, we you know we were we were as ostracized as they would have been in the way except we had a crew of you know 100 people with us but it you know it really it is really impactful and it's I think it's beautiful up there there's not really any other landscape like it it's quite sort of it's quite lunar, it, it, um, and and the sky feels quite low. So you, it's quite yeah, it's quite particular. I love it, but it, yeah, it really obviously really informs you know everything you know, and visually it's just so beautiful that yeah, it's yeah. It's it's also like nowhere else I think I've ever seen in the world. You know, there's something it's beautiful, but it's also incredibly haunting a place. Mm, it's, yeah, you know, when the wind picks up and. It's it yeah it, it's it's I think it's a set it's it's a character in itself within the movie and it's Definitely. a sort of important character and I think that that's so much of what's in the book as well is the the sort of the sound of the moors and all of that mm. stuff. So. Yeah, you know, speaking of character, both of your characters, we know a little bit about each of them historically, but there's a lot of gaps to fill in, and I know uh, Francis did that with the script. Were you two involved with filling in some of the gaps of the characters and making suggestions as to how to flesh them out? No. What, what do you think, Ollie? Did you? I mean, I feel like I had a very, very different task than, than you did. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> well, but, you know, but I think, I mean, so much of it was already written. Like Francis yeah. spent 10 years sort of working on this script and researching and, and, and so I think so much of it was on the page and then anything else that that sort of came along that, that sort of the actor brings, uh, you know, was sort of brought to the table afterwards. But but I think I mean, I don't, I'm sure I don't know how you. Yeah, feel. it was all it was all in the script. You know, I don't there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, we, we had rehearsal time before and everything and we had to do our research and we didn't have to. I chose to do research and everything. But no, it was it was pretty clear what France wanted. So we just kind of had to bring that forward, really. 
Emma Mackey, Oliver Jackson Cohen, thank you so much for talking to me today. Emily in theaters on the 24th, really, really liked it. Thank you. Like I say, an interesting film, and I'm really surprised uh, Warner Brothers has gotten behind this and uh, has actually released this in theaters. I mean, it's the sort of film anymore that you find streaming. Okay. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it, it's interesting that it's on the big screen, and it needs to be seen there, too. Very good. Um, let's talk a little bit about, well, you want, why don't, since we're talking about Emily and everyone is now primed for knowledge with this movie, mm -hmm. tell us about the second interview. Well, the second interview had. I did was with Frances O'Connor, and you know her. Mm -hmm. She's an actress, mm -hmm. been around for quite a long time. Um, and as I said, this was, you know, Emily Bronte, she, she told me that, uh, you know, she'd read Wuthering Heights when she was a teenager and just, you know, was fascinated with it since then. Um, one of the things that when you watch the film, is the atmosphere of this movie. I mean, if you've seen any version of Wuthering Heights or if you've read the novel, the atmosphere of the Moors is so important. It's so vital. I mean, I, I hate it when people say, well, you know, the, the environment is a character too. That seems kind of hackneyed. But in here it is mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. case because you see in this movie how this perpetually overcast wild area affects these characters. Rainy, dreary, oh, it windy. Affects their mood, affects how they relate to each other, uh, affects how you would, of course, write or do any sort of art. And right. and she really makes sure, kind of makes sure, this is her first film directing oh, and writing, really? by the way, which okay. I was really impressed with. Uh, she talks about how, you know, they really make sure to capture that because that's important okay. as far as, you know, you know how people get in the wintertime around oh, yeah. here, you oh, know, yeah, yeah. how it affects your mood, how it affects your outlook on everything. And, and so, and she realizes that obviously that would have an effect on them. Right. Uh, and so that's one of the things she talks about in the interview. And, I re and that was one of the things that I thought was very striking in the film. You know, I love that weather. Yes. Yes, you do. And, <laughs> that's and, what and makes I, you happy and, and peaceful. And, and I was like, oh, well, I want to go to there, <laughs> as Tina Fey would say. Uh, but yeah, really a, a, a cool interview. So uh, yeah, let's take a look and hear what uh, Miss O'Connor has to say. Chuck Kaplinsky from WCIA TV. I'm talking to writer, director, actress Frances O'Connor today about her film Emily, about Emily Bronte. Beautiful film. Uh, Miss O'Connor, my favorite novel is, is Great Expectations, and I try to read it every few years. And as I change, of course, the way I look at the novel changes. When was the first time you read Wuthering Heights, and how has your perception of it changed over the years? Yeah, I think I read it when I was 15 on a a school bus I had like a half hour's journey and I, I remember getting off the bus and feeling like I'd been somewhere you know like um and those characters really spoke to me they were kind of rebellious and naughty and they did what they wanted and they had this freedom to them and there was an atmosphere in the book I felt you know this this wild woolly kind of landscape was somewhere I felt like I wanted to, to be um, and then as, a, as, a, as I kind of grew up, I, you know, it, for me, that is the book I return to that and Jane Eyre, I think I really love those two, two novels. And I think as an older person, um, I don't know, I think the structure of it is very interesting. Mm -hmm. And the idea of, of like the echoes within one storyline and one generation and how they mm -hmm. get echoed out into to later on in the novel is really powerful. And then just the kind of metaphysical kind of world as well is really powerful. Yeah. You know, you mentioned the atmosphere in the book and you captured that very well here in, in oh. Emily as, as well. The location shooting is just gorgeous. Were there any surprises when you got out there? Did anything change once you actually got out there? I mean, I was already aware of Haworth when I wrote it. I had been up there I actually went there as a young actress for the first time I had a couple of weeks off from a shoot and I went up there and it was kind of the way they run that parsonage it's like they the Brontes have just left <laughs> and, uh, it's it's really run with a lot of love and uh I really it really kind of spoke to my imagination what was interesting actually is that when we you can't really shoot around there now because um you know there's a lot of telephone wires in shot and things so we went about an hour's north and that area is just so beautiful it's mm -hmm. it's very wild and woolly and actually it does remind you a lot of the novel um and it was great for the actors too to get up there on those windy hills and kind mm -hmm. of their hair blown around and you know <laughs> kind of get into it definitely you know, you're filling in a lot of gaps here with with emily's life we know some about her but not much what did you base did you base a lot of that on kathy from the book or how did you go about just doing 
character. It's, it's, it's really quite something. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to tell a story about uh, a young woman who was different, who didn't fit in, but had this kind of very authentic voice and her journey towards accepting that in herself. Because uh, I feel like that's a really positive thing to kind of put out there for, you know, young people, young women coming up. So once I kind of had decided that was the narrative with the research, I kind of I kind of discovered all these different things, but I tried not to think of it in a linear way. I felt like if it could work in terms of the story I wanted to tell, then I would add that in. So and then also but not to be literal with it. So right. things like mask, the mask was a real object that the Brontes had in uh in the parsonage it was given to them as a wedding present and he did make them put it the, on the children to speak oh. and i just suddenly thought well this is a great kind of gothic object that could kind of connect to emily's creativity connect to the mother the lost mother and um and and so so then it kind of became this this scene where Emily could kind of express herself through the mask, but it's kind of too much for other people. So yeah, it kind of went like that in a way. Um, yeah. Francis O'Connor, thank you so much for talking to me today. My pleasure. Out here on the 24th, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you, thanks Chuck. Yeah, I have a feeling uh, that that her intent is to uh, have us all pull out our old copies of right. of Wuthering Heights, and I did. Did you? I, I read it maybe a year or two ago, uh, but I have a great edition uh, with, with essays on as well, and I read a couple of them. And I should have done it before because if nothing else, this movie really got me curious about Emily Bronte, okay. and also underscored the fact that man, they had crappy lives. Yeah, all these girls died young. Well, for I mean, some reason, I had it in my mind that she died. She committed suicide. I, is there a reason why I thought that? I don't know, but they think her brother dies two weeks before she dies. Mm. And conjecture is that uh, she caught a cold, it moved to her lungs, and they, the sources that I've read list her as cause of death is tuberculosis. Oh, shit. Okay. So I don't know if it was tuberculosis, pneumonia, something like that. Okay. But they trace it back to her. Again, the atmosphere, the weather, right. standing around her husband, her uh, brother's coffin, yes. and, you know, yeah. and, and, the, and that dad <laughs> had done it. Huh. Uh, so that's what they, they think. Okay. But, uh, yeah, God, rough lives. Yeah, definitely. So glad we're living and, in today's And these people era. had money. You know, these people <laughs> yeah. were relatively right? well off. And still, you know, the, the vagaries of, of, of the weather and lack of medicine, everything, it, yeah, that doesn't didn't shield you from it. No, no, cold, damp, dark situations not a good thing. Even though they it makes Chuck happy, it's not a good place to live. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> agree to disagree. <laughs> uh, let's go on to another Apple TV series called Hello Tomorrow. This has your favorite guy in it. It does, mm. Billy Crudup. I love Billy Crudup. He plays Jack, and he. Hey, is... did you, you guys know the story of when Pam met Billy Crudup uh... at the Critics Choice Awards? Oh, you're groaning. <laughs> Groaning. I don't know if I remember any story oh, it with was it. Great. And he, he was walking right towards you. Your back, your back was to him. Yeah. And I said, "Here comes Billy Crudup. Here comes Billy Crudup." And you were then like uh, eight years old. <laughs> <laughs> you, you you just kind of did a little dance, and you put your hands up, and you turned around, and it was a beautiful picture. We'll try and find it and post it on Facebook. But yeah, that was a that's a good memory of mine from those because you were genuinely excited to meet Mister Crudup. I was. I have loved him from afar for I don't know how long. Ever since one of his first movies, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, if you find that picture, please please do post it because I knew someone took a photo of that. Oh, yeah, I'm looking now. And and Kristen said that she didn't do it. I'm like somebody has to have that photo i'm looking so, all right check it out so anyway billy Crudup plays jack who is a timeshare salesman basically for the moon um it's set back in the 1950s it's uh it, it's kind of a cool concept it's back in the 1950s yet it's futuristic at the same time so some of the things that they incorporate into that world of the 1950s are spot on 1950s all the cars all the the dresses and the situations yet we're plunged into the future where people, only the rich, are able to go to the moon and afford to buy things on the moon. But now here we have this this new timeshare company. I think it's called Bright Star. And mm. people can actually have a place on the moon. Well, is it true? Is it not? Are, are these like just basically door-to-door -door salesmen or uh, snake oil salesmen of, of yesteryear? Or are they telling the truth? Um, 
Hanifa uh, Wood plays Shirley. She's the secretary. Duchesne Williams is also one of the salespeople, along with Hank Azaria, who oh, plays I do too, who plays Eddie, who has a lot of issues. Um, really fun show. If you haven't started watching it, start now. Um, I don't know if they're dropping every single week or if they've dropped them all at the same time. Check this series out on Apple TV. But before you do, check out this interview that I had with three of the stars. Unfortunately, Billy couldn't make it. Aww. Rain check, Billy. But we do have Hanifa, Duchesne, and Hank. So much for joining me on WCIA TV to talk about your new Apple TV series, Hello Tomorrow. Um, you know, this is a visually striking series. It's, it's inventive, the storyline. But what makes it so much fun is your characters. Hank, I want to start with you. Your character of Eddie, somehow, I don't think you've ever played a character quite like him before. Tell me about Eddie and how he fits into the storyline and maybe how you, I don't know, do you personally connect to him at all? I do, sadly. <laughs> um, you know, Eddie is a gambling addict, a very passionate guy. I've definitely had certain obsessions overtake me at different times in my life. I can relate to, you know, I certainly can relate to loving sports teams so much that when they lose, you really lose your mind. And um, I relate to being, I both ends of the love affair that Hanifa and I play out, I've, I've been on either end of that. We are trying to wrangle someone who's insane or you're kind of the insane person yourself. And yet you have this deep, deep love connection. You try to keep getting back to each other. So it was fun to play all that out in a nice 50s suit. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, talking about the 1950s, Hanif, I want to pose this question to you. Um, we go back in time, but we're looking toward the future as well. And, and your character pushes those 1950s gender stereotypes. And it's a beautiful balance that you create. Um, when you took the role of Shirley, how did you make this character your own and really give us that finely tuned, balanced performance? Oh, well, thank you, first of all. Um, I think when I looked at Shirley or when I read the character that she had so many layers like anybody else in the world would have. And I really enjoyed playing that, that she's Although she's very competent in what she's doing and very strong, she's extremely flawed. She's in love with a man outside of her marriage, which is so real life. Um, and I think that Shirley enabled me to spread my wings in a way that I haven't been able to, um, just because she's so complex. Very good. Deshane, um, Hello Tomorrow takes place, I'm going to guess, well before you were ever even born. Um, that's got to create some... <laughs> even before I was born. Well, okay, okay. And me too. I'm, I'm going to jump on that bandwagon as well. That's all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it's got to create some pretty interesting conversations about what went on back in the day. And are there any characteristics that you find appealing of that time era? Uh, there were a lot of culturally significant things that happened in that era. And so, I mean, in my own life, I just studied that era, like just because I, not for the show, but I was just one of those people, like I love history in this sense. Okay. And so um, it wasn't, it didn't seem so distant from me because I'm interested in uh, the decades in this way. And I, I do remember spending quite a bit of time when I was in my early 20s, like just researching what was going on in like the 50s and 60s. So this role kind of felt right for me because I kind of knew what I could add to it to kind of help build that world in a believable way. Um, and this next question is for both Hank and Hanifa. Um, what what aspects of that era do you find appealing and um, that you can relate to and you might want to bring into the our future? Is there anything? Well, like I the love car. the style. I love the style of the time, right? So all of my costumes, I love that wig that I had on. I, I love the <laughs> very feminine nature of the 50s, right? Like it felt like femininity was celebrated in a certain way where you wanted to show your curves, but you also were a lady. So you're covered up 
but not at the same time. Right. Uh, I would love, I mean, I'm trying to revisit it now. I'm very much so a tomboy. So uh, being in those clothes and being in that hair and that makeup and even the nails um, really helped me with my character. Very good. How about you, Hank? Yeah, I mean, wearing those suits, that style, yeah. especially clothing wise, um, you know, first time I looked at myself in the mirror, I was like, there's my grandpa. No. Um, <laughs> and uh, from pictures that I'd seen. And, uh, you know, you sort of show up for your life differently, you even show up on the set a little differently when yeah. you just kind of your work day is, is a hat and a, and, and a suit and a tie uh, in that incredible style, you kind of feel different. Um, that era was so much about hope, you know, everyone had come through the war. And uh, one level or another, there was some version of uh, of real deep optimism um, for a lot of folks that um, was pervasive and, you know, uh, didn't quite pan out. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it was a time that we can all really like grab on. That's what I think of when I think of this optimistic, cheery version of things yeah. was that time. Right. Now, if Hanifa would want to go back to the 50s, hell no. Yeah. <laughs> like our real time 50. No. Uh, thank you, all three of you so much for not only joining me to talk about this incredible new and inventive series, but for creating these great characters that are going to hook everybody and keep everybody watching. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. I hope you enjoyed listening to the three stars of Hello Tomorrow, streaming on Apple TV+. Plus. Okay, Chuck, are you ready? This is the last interview of our special segment, our special episode of Real Talk with Chuck and Pam. Chuck, you're not saying anything. All right, well, I'm ready, and I think our listeners are as well. We've got an interview, or I had an interview, with the stars for Outer Banks that's streaming on Netflix. They just dropped uh, season number three. Chase Stokes, who plays JJ, and Rudy Poncow, who plays JJ, joined me in Chicago to talk about how their characters have changed and what to expect in season number three. Chase, Rudy, thank you so much for joining me on WCIA TV to talk about Outer Banks season three. Before we start, though, I have to thank you both and Netflix because season one came out right at the beginning of the lockdown for COVID. And man, did I need something fun to watch. And you guys provided that for me, hooked me for season two. And now here we are at season three. Um, you know, we got a treasure hunt, we got a mystery, we got a thriller, and we even have some sweet love stories in this, which is just so much fun. Um, now, in season three, do you feel like your characters have grown and changed? Chase, let's start with you. Yeah, yeah, I think John B is really starting to realize the uh, the ramifications for the actions and the situations that he's put everybody in. And it sort of comes to the help. You know, there's this big epiphany at the end of the second season where his dad's alive. And it's going to be a lot of push and pull this year. And I think that for him, it's going to either force a lot of growth or a lot of, you know, Explosion, for lack of a better term. Because there is a lot of explosion. There's yes, a lot there of are. <laughs> How about you, Rudy? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of growth in ways that I think JJ might not want. I think he's scared of growing up. I think he's scared of responsibility. Uh, and that's kind of thrown on to him, I think, real soon because his dad kind of is like, bye. Yeah. And then it's like, wait, uh, what does that mean for me? And, you know, then he kind of has to come to reality once he leaves. Mm -hmm. Poglandia. Daddy issues. <laughs> Daddy issues. So, yeah. Um, I, I have to ask this question. You guys are in your 20s, somewhere thereabouts, yeah. not teenagers anymore. However, <laughs> you're my son. <laughs> <too. laughs> However, there's not one moment that I don't believe that you guys are seniors in high school. Well, thank you. Cool. What yeah. aspect of your own upbringing and maybe high school years mm -hmm. yourself did you bring to this character to, to create that sense of authenticity? You know. Um, so I grew up like 30 minutes outside of Cocoa Beach in Florida. And so there was a lot of uh, beach delinquency going on in, in my upbringing. <laughs> and, uh, so when I read the script and, and saw that it was what it was, I was like, oh, okay, I've got a couple moments to pull from in particular. Uh, but I think, yeah, I, I, I wasn't, like John B., I wasn't as invested in school as I was extracurricular activities. 
But yeah, no, I think it was a lot of, of especially being a young, fresh actor and being green, so to speak. Uh, you kind of pull on the strings of what you know and, and what you have that's close to your heart. And I think that's every actor's process is finding the truth in it. So I was very fortunate that John B and I had a couple through lines of from that stuff at that time in my life. Very good. How about you, Rudy? Same. Like uh, growing up in a fishing town, similar mm-hmm. to the Outer Banks, uh, also tourist town. So okay. I think like the similarities of like Turons in, in the show mm-hmm. played a huge similarity in, in my, my coming up. About that yeah, one. yeah, yeah, yeah. Turons. Yeah. Uh, and my upbringing is that it's like there's the people that come into the island and then they leave, and like, you know, there's the local side, there's right. the local people. And that that is a thing in my hometown of Ketchikan uh, and beach. Is, mm-hmm. It's like that's the place you throw a party. It's just you go to the beach. Have some pallets, mm-hmm. which are not necessarily legal, but at the <laughs> same time, it was um, it was a really good time, and I definitely had some similarities with the show with that. Okay, I was not anticipating that answer to that question, given that Ketchikan is in Alaska. So yes, I was yeah. not expecting that. Um, you alluded to the fact that there are a lot of explosions that are in all of the seasons, mm-hmm. and season three is promising to have exactly a lot of that kind of fun chase scene as well with some yeah. explosions. Tell me about, do you do any of these actual scenes or do you have stunt doubles for doing all of this stuff? How do you guys do this? Yeah, it's sort of a, a two-hander. Like we try to do the majority of our stuff, but it's always done a hell of a lot better by our stunt doubles. Yeah. So we're very fortunate that we have an incredible stunt team that keeps us safe and does these, these big, massive set pieces and stunts. Um, in particular this year, we had quite a few big ins. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, I love the stunt team that we have. It's a, it is a kind of a fun dynamic because you get to know them really well, and then yeah. you're like, you kind of get to know what they are, what I'm capable of, and they get to know what you, as an actor, can do. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're like, you kind of look at each other and you're like, you got this one. And you're like, yeah, sure, I'm going to go. And it's a fun, like, it's a fun time to like have that, big, like, just it's a fun chemistry. Dynamic, Chem- yeah. It's a different type of chemistry with your stunt double, which is fun. So give me an example of one that you did that you were like, yeah, I got this one. There's this, I mean, I was lucky enough to like be able to actually ride the motorcycle by myself. Like I was able to like, like not not have him like, uh, like come in or anything. It was just me doing it by myself. And I I came into a scene, there's this scene where I come to see you Mm -hmm. and I come in on the motorcycle and I thought for sure, I thought for sure they were going to be like, let's have the stunt double do it. No, that was me the entire time. Yeah, I, I, mean, was, I love doing that. I had a scene speaking of motorcycles in the first season. No. And, uh, what? Yeah. Oh. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I thought you said no. I no, 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 no. <laughs> um, Where I get mad and I'm like, what's the goal? Blah, 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 and I go to start his motorcycle and I try to steal it. And I got it like the first two takes fine and I took off and then like every take after that the bike wouldn't start. <laughs> and I'm like on it just like, hang it, hang it, come on, come on. <laughs> like, John B. Way! And they're all, John B. Way! They're like, hey, don't, don't go. Yeah, yeah. Don't, 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 don't. And, right away. And then we had a uh, double who actually doubled Rudy a lot in the first season who's a freak on motorcycle, Jason. And uh, Jason just hopped on there and just like burnt yeah. out, ripped a wheelie out of there and I was like, that should for sure be <laughs> show, not me. And they did. Yeah. Yeah. To me, this this storyline has so many appealing factors that mm-hmm. even old people like me have a lot of fun watching. What is it that you think is, is so appealing about this series that has really hooked probably audiences around the world? I think the idea of friendship and, and kind of finding your track. You know, we've been stuck in, and when the show came out, you know, we were in a time period that we had never experienced in human history we right. were in full isolation. So seeing that dynamic of friendship and finding people who are going to be honest with you when you don't want it and when you need it, um, and then also people who are going to commit to going on a crazy journey with you, that's something that we just were not able to experience. So I think people of all ages and people around the entire world could all relate to that, is finding that tribe and finding that group of people. So I think that at its core was was the reality. and then. The idea of a treasure hunt. Like, who doesn't want to go out right. and explore the world and, and you know have a little risk in their life and ain't no reward without a little risk. So, I think it was just all of these little components and, and ingredients into this you know little soup that we created. Um, that was things that people were missing and, and even pre-COVID. 
just life and, and we were kind of just moving through the motions. Right. So we were forced to stop and be like, oh, okay, we should get outside. And they don't use their phones at all. <laughs> no, <laughs> let's get away from that. So I think it was, it was just kind of a subtle reminder to get out and live. Very good. And then you guys are best buddies, along with the other the other kids in the group, if you will. Um, but you guys are super tight. Um, how do you how do you create that, especially season one and then season three, without giving any spoilers away? You're still super tight. So how do you create that on on set? Respect. Mm. Respect. R e s b c d. No, I think it's a lot of trust, a lot of respect, and I think um, we were. We knew season one that it was like we got we got we got to get to know each other pretty quick here, and I think there was like that pressure from like wanting to get to know each other, but there also was the just simple want of like, hey, we're on this crazy journey together. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess this is how I feel. Mm -hmm. Where it's just like I kind of want to have uh, my 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 duo here, my like partner in crime, to like we're going on this together. We're both. We were both unknown actors. This is a lot of pressure. We got this, and we're gonna to need to have a conversation after pretty much every day. How did it go? And I was so thankful to be able to live with this guy season one, and um, I think that really solidified that. Yeah, you know, it's funny to see it on the posters this year because Rudy, one of the first things he said to me when we started the show, and it's been a theme that him and I have held near and dear to our hearts this entire course was nothing to lose. And so when we saw the trailer for the first time and the poster art, we were like. Oh, okay. We'll take it. We'll take it. <laughs> it was a fun thing. It was cool to see that. Yeah, like, oh. so that's kind of been our, our slogan this, uh, this entire course of the show. Very good. Well, especially if you both um, hadn't really done a whole lot of acting prior to this, yeah. Nothing to Lose is really probably a pretty good motto. You had everything to gain, yeah. and you did. Mm -hmm. um, is there any one thing or one scene, without giving any spoilers away, mm -hmm. we don't want to give anything away, mm -hmm. that you're looking forward for viewers to see this season? Again, no spoilers. No mm -hmm. spoilers. I remind myself. No spoilers. Um, I think I would want people to see friendships and how, like, that we portray them raw. Like mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of rawness this season uh, for a lot of characters. And I'm not spoiling anything, but I think it's episode eight. Right? Yeah, we have that raw, yeah. really raw moment. If someone's yeah. just gonna say that, okay. I think that's not a spoiler, right? Yeah. 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 Nah, I don't think so. Raw, interesting way to put it. Like. Raw, <laughs> like raw, raw, raw. raw. You, you know, everyone's raw. gonna binge through until they yeah. get to, to episode eight. Mm, yes. Don't <laughs> skip anything. Yeah. Start from don't get that. One last question for you. Season one, we're in the Outer Banks. Um, season two, we were we had a little bit of a glimpse of Barbados. Mm -hmm. Not going to give away what happens in season three, but if and when there is a season four, and you could pitch anything to Netflix and say, "I want to go here for the next treasure hunt," where would you want to go? What island? What place? <laughs> I know. Um, uh, if you were to ask Jonas that question, I think he would be the one to probably answer that it would be where is the best surf um and a uh, hotel that can yeah. fit the majority food. of our crew okay and then food yeah, yeah food yeah. Yeah. i mean jonas eats like peanuts <laughs> he's a healthy guy he's a healthy guy um you know i actually i'm not you know, i i i actually would say <laughs> oh my god look at it right right <laughs> <laughs> no um i actually do think I want to see the show take a little bit more place in the Outer Banks. Like, if they're acting, and like maybe even if it's possible, I don't know, like, you know, have a little bit more of a, like, it's called the Outer Banks. So, like, maybe have that kind of circle around. Because I think season one, it has that message of, like, this is the Outer Banks life. Right. But these past two seasons take place elsewhere equally, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, than the Outer Banks and elsewhere. Well, season three takes place in the Outer Banks quite a bit. I shouldn't mm -hmm. say that. But I agree with just you. kind of bringing back the this this feeling of the the coop side, the pug side. I feel like it's been so focused on treasure that I think ha kind of getting to know the island uh, just that little bit more would be a fun thing. So. Yeah, I agree. I think that you know there's been so much that's happened, and uh, I think it's important for these kids to live in that for a little while. You know when they get back to some homes, what does that look like? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I agree. I, I, I love... I love Barbados, by the way. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> when you get to film in the best places, but there's something beautiful about 
reconnecting with your home and yeah. reconnecting with that that core of where you come from and with it being ripped away from them in the ways that it has in the show what does that look like you know yeah. is it the same home is it not and then you got to spend some time there to, to really understand that so yeah i think we'll see a little bit of that this season and if we were able to you know, get the opportunity to do another season in the future that would be my one yeah but, yeah. We'll so, see what the cards hold. Sounds good. Chase, Rudy, thank you so much for joining me to talk about season three of Outer Banks. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this special episode of Real Talk with Chuck and Pam. I know that Chuck and I had a lot of fun doing these interviews. We hope you enjoyed listening to them and maybe even piqued your interest in watching something new. Thanks for listening, everyone. We will be back next week with our video podcast as well as the audio version next week with a special guest. And we hope you tune in. Thank you so much for listening. Real Talk with Chuck and Pam.